Okay, thanks, everybody. I've been involved with Greenpeace since the 1980s. Um, here's some pictures of me. I, I give talks, I campaign, I take direct action. Today, I want to talk about uh, energy. Uh, my talk is entitled Electrify Everything, and I'll come on to explain why that is. Um, arguably, this addresses the SDGs 7 and 9, and also perhaps 2. Um, you're all aware of the climate crisis. Scientists have uh, moved on from using technical terms to describing the current situation in terms like this. Gobsmackingly bananas. Scientists stunned by the planet's record September heat. And, um, you know, we know that at the same time that there's a, a, a drought in Somalia that's been going on since 2015, at the, exactly the same time, Pakistan having the worst floods uh, that they've ever experienced. So our climate is in crisis. We're getting extreme weather. And many of you will have seen this uh, this diagram, this analogy of using uh, describing our atmosphere as a bathtub. The uh, the water pouring in the top uh, is uh, equivalent to our emissions of fossil fuels uh, and uh, our parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere going up and up and up. And uh, the the uh, plug at the bottom of the bathtub, if we can rattle that a bit to let some of that carbon out via uh, the oceans absorbing carbon and also plants and soils uh, absorbing. And so we know what we need to do, broadly speaking, that we all understand. We need to leave fossil fuels in the ground. We need to switch to renewables. We need to reduce our energy waste. We also need to reform agriculture, and that will include eating a way less meat. And we need to halt the deforestation, especially of the rainforests. So in the UK, and I'm going to give a UK perspective, but much of what I'm going to be saying does relate or you'll find parallels in your own countries. Um, the UK government back um, at, uh, have uh, passed the Climate Change Act, and this commits the UK government by law to reducing greenhouse gas emissions by at least 100% of the 1990 baseline. So they took 1990 as the baseline, and that target equivalent is being described as net zero by 2050. And um, they also have interim targets. And uh, one of the interim targets, which is the UK's nationally determined contribu contribution. So this is our international commitment to the planet. That was to reduce on the 1990 baseline by 68% by 2030. And uh, in the sixth carbon budget, which is part of the UK's Climate Change Act, uh, to reduce by 78% by between 2033 and 37. Now, between 1990 and 2021, the UK's emissions fell by 48%. So that means that sounds good, but we still need to cut by half in the next 10 years and then by half again by the end of the 2030s. And the key thing there is that that means that most of these emission cuts will have to come from existing technology, which is ready to scale up. We can't wait for some magic new solution. We have to use what we have. And that means mobilizing on what we can describe as the big five in energy. And so strategy is to electrify everything and roll out tech at speed and scale. So it means renewables especially offshore wind in the UK, it means we need to smarten and extend our national grid, which is how we distribute electricity in the UK. And we have to increase our storage. We have to electrify our vehicle transport. We have to change our buildings. It's interesting what Rowan said about buildings. And uh, we have to replace all our aging gas central heating systems with heat pumps. And if we don't do this, then any targets that we're setting are a forlorn hope. There's also some other challenges around industry, aviation, shipping, waste, fluorinated gases and agriculture, but they aren't my topic today. So electrify everything, electrify supply side and demand side. Looking at the UK, the first thing is offshore wind. And the UK is ideal for the UK um, for offshore wind. 
We have a windy coastline. We have a shallow seabed and a large continental shelf. So that's good. Uh, onshore wind is quick to install and uh, it's significantly quicker than many of the other types of renewable. However, it does come up against a lot of opposition in the UK. They're not in, you know, not in a my back garden type thing. And the one that, again, I guess you're familiar with, solar photovoltaic, which is the cheapest source of electricity. Uh, costs have fallen about 60% since 2010. And for utility scale, by about 88% by 2010. And of course, the other thing that always happens when we talk about renewable energy is that critics say, yeah, it's all right, but the wind isn't always blowing, the sun isn't always shining. And of course, we do need storage. We need to overgenerate when the wind is blowing and when the sun is shining. And then we need to store that so that we can consume it when the wind isn't blowing and when the sun isn't shining. And the UK is injecting 30 million into energy storage innovation. 30 million sounds like a lot. It really isn't. It's a drop in the ocean. And the UK needs something like 50 gigawatts of energy storage in order to meet our net zero goal by 2050. And that's the national grid figures. At the moment, we've got about 1.3 gigawatts and there's about 3.2 gigawatts in the pipeline. So that shows you the gap between what we have and what we need. However, the story isn't all bad in the UK. Um, in uh, the first two quarters of this year, in quarter two, in 2023, the UK share of renewable energy generation was 42% and fossil fuels was 38%. So we are moving in the right direction. However, there is a major, major, major st stumbling block in the UK and that is the national grid. Now, essentially, the national grid is what connects uh, the power generation to the power consumption. And the national grid is aging. And that headline there by the octopus boss, Octopus is one of the largest renewable energy companies in the UK. And it basically says the national grid is not fit for purpose. And what that means is that um, renewable projects, and there are many that are in the pipeline, and many renewable companies want to build renewable projects, either onshore or offshore wind or solar farms, they cannot get those connected to the national grid. They're having to wait five or more years for new projects to be connected. And that means that we're hopelessly missing all of our targets. We missed the offshore wind target, and the onshore wind target. And that headline there says that England is at the current rate, something like 4,700 years from building enough onshore wind farms. And so the national grid itself is a major problem, but there is another major problem. And that's the way that the government lets contracts for new projects for energy supply. And that meant that uh, in the latest round of the UK subsidy auction, it failed to attract any offshore wind bids. And you think, well, why is that? Well, it's quite simple. What happens is the way these bids work is that the government quotes or states a maximum price. And that's the maximum price that the companies can bid. And then it's a reverse auction. They have to bid less and less and less. And the one that bids the cheapest price will win the contract. And that's what they're saying is we will deliver wholesale electricity at that price. And essentially what happened was when the government set this new auction that's just finished and uh, failed to attract any bids, they set the price, the maximum price too low. And all of the energy companies said, we can't make any money at that price. And to give you an idea of of how that works out, um, a, a Swedish company, Vattenfall, Boreas, were due to build a 1.4 gigawatt offshore wind farm off the east coast of Britain, off the coast of Norfolk. And they've pulled out, and they've pulled out because they've said that their costs, the cost of raw materials, the cost of labor, and so on, have gone up so much in the last couple of years 
that they can no longer deliver that project and make a profit. Meanwhile, on the other side of the country, in the West Country, near where I live, um, at Hinkley Point C Nuclear Power Station, which is being constructed but is already 10 years overdue, 10 years late, is still going ahead. And one of the reasons it's still going ahead is that in order to win the contract, Vattenfall had to bid a price of £37.35 per megawatt hour. Meanwhile, the people who are building Hinkley Point are guaranteed £106 per megawatt hour, and that's index linked. When they bid, they were uh, bidding at £92.50. They're now guaranteed £106. So you can see that there's a huge disparity between what renewable energy companies are expected to deliver energy at and what the nuclear industry is getting subsidised by. The other problem that we've got in the UK is that there's a lot of disinformation and a lot, a lot of pushback. And recently, there was a right-wing think tank, Civitas, uh, published a, a report. And the report was claiming that the net zero would cost UK taxpayers trillions. And the reason it claimed trillions was that the authors managed to confuse power capacity in megawatt hours with electricity generation, sorry, power capacity in megawatts with electricity generation in megawatt hours. They managed to confuse billions with trillions, and they ended up giving a figure of £1.3 million per megawatt hour for the cost of onshore wind. And in fact, the real price is something like £50 to £70 pounds per megawatt hour, just 10,000 times wrong. And of course, they published that report. They've withdrawn it. But many people have read that. They'll have read the report. They won't have read the withdrawal. And they will think that that reflects reality. So that's the supply side. On the demand side, we also have problems. The first thing is, again, the national grid. There are many companies trying to roll out electric vehicle charging points up and down the country, especially on our motorways. And the government, again, is way off target for meeting the number of EV charging points. The government announced a £1 billion fund to expand the electric vehicle charging network. But three years after they announced that fund, there have been no, no one's had access to that fund. No payments have been made from it. And again, the UK, that headline you can see there, the UK's national grid is not ready for the increase in demand from electric cars. Essentially, people wanting to build service points that can charge electric cars can't get enough electricity via the national grid to, uh, to make them work. There's another problem, which is basically the car market itself. And many of you will be familiar with the fact that uh, China has a large amount of the car market in terms of the raw materials needed for the batteries on electric vehicles, 95% of the manganese, around 70% of the cobalt and graphite, two thirds of the lithium and 60% of the nickel, all key components in lithium ion batteries. And at the moment in Europe, there are we currently produce no battery grade lithium and that, as a result, means that of the 850,000 electric cars that were imported into Europe last year, over a half came from China, including my own car. Now, Rowan's talked a lot about uh, buildings. And just quickly in the UK, um, UK buildings, uh, as of June last year, they all have to have an electric vehicle charging point. Great. But they at the moment, don't have to have solar panels, although a number of builders do fit solar panels. Um, and our MPs are in support of making solar panels mandatory, but the government's chosen not to do that yet. And our housing stock is old. About 15% of our total carbon emissions in the UK come directly from homes. 
it's estimated that 26 million of today's homes, that's about 80% of those that are currently standing, will be still around in 2050. And that means between now and 2050, if we're going to achieve um, uh, net zero, we um, need to um, retrofit, fit them, re retrofit them. And that cost at the moment, the average cost of retrofitting is £26,000 at today's prices. So if you retrofitted it and then the energy bill was £2,000 a year, which is the current sort of cost, the payback period is still 10 years. And um, for individual measures, the payback period can be much longer. Again, uh, window double glazing can take up to 40 years to recoup the cost. For my own part, I've done the good things. So I've got solar panels on my house. That's my car. It's an electric vehicle with its charging point. But when we went to look at um, uh, putting in a heat pump, we found we ran into problems. Uh, you haven't got the right pipes. And it just doesn't work. Um, and so there has actually been quite a pushback against renewable energy in the UK. Um, Boris Johnson, our last prime minister, but one, uh, was forced out of office and there was a by-election in his Uxbridge constituency and um, Labour expected to win it, but they lost. And one of the reasons was that uh, there was, uh, at the same time, the London mayor was introducing the ultra low emission zone to try and improve the quality of air in London. And uh, that was why many politicians felt that uh, the election was lost. And uh, David Frost there says that green policies are unpopular when there's a cost to people. So uh, our prime minister decided to scrap all of his uh, green policies. He U-turned on uh, a number of them, including the home energy thing. Uh, on the, uh, He gave the go-ahead for a new oil field in Rosebank. And uh, that's put the, the UK way back. And you can see how the UK compares to other countries around the world if you look at the Climate Action Tracker. And in fact, as you see there on the Climate Action Tracker, comparing government's commitments and actions against achieving a target of no more than 1.5 degrees C increase in, in uh, global average global temperatures, you can see that there's not a single country now that is on target. The UK is back uh, as insufficient. We move from almost sufficient to insufficient. And you can see the picture around the world is pretty grim. Um, as I say, I'm I'm a member of Greenpeace. Uh, when Rishi Sunak vowed to max out and uh, give more drilling licenses in the UK for off-sea uh, North Sea oil, um, we took action. He, he wasn't at home and we went and we covered his home in black fabric to indicate the black oil that was going to be causing problems for future generations and that the fact that his plan would send a wrecking ball through climate commitments. And I'm involved in a new project, which is Project Climate Vote, where we're trying to get people to commit to casting their vote at the next general election in the UK based on the candidates uh, manifestos and voting for the candidate that has the best climate credentials. So that's a, div a, a new way of working for Greenpeace that we're going to be doing in the UK. So that's a very quick roundup of the market, uh, the energy market and the lack of good action that UK government is taking. Thank you very much for listening.